but yeah, that's working. Good. Okay. All right. I want to start out by uh, reassuring you I'm not going to be doing a, pro an, uh, a projector talk today. I'm going to be doing a Blackboard talk. Uh, but I do want to start off with one screen here because I think this illustrates my purpose in my lecture today b better than I could myself. And that's uh, illustrated here. Okay. Uh, you can see this, this, these two guys, obvious scientists because they're wearing lab coats, are talking at a blackboard, and uh, it's, covered, it's covered with equations, and then a miracle occurs, and then it's covered with, so yeah. Okay. That side, okay. Great, excellent. So the blackboard's covered with equations, and then there's the, the phase, and then a miracle occurs, and then it's covered by more equations. And the uh, second scientist is asked by the first scientist, I think you should be a little more explicit here in step two. And I realize this is what my lecture was like yesterday, right? I told you that, uh, okay, so we're going to shut this down. I started out by telling you the idea of hydrodynamic theories, which are that your gradient expand. You expand in fields, you enforce the symmetries, and then I said, voila, a miracle occurs, and you get the Toner 2 equations. And these were quite complicated looking equations, and I didn't fill you in on anything about the steps that led from there to there. So, so it's almost exactly like the uh, example illustrated in that cartoon. So what I want to do today is fill in these steps. How do you get from these ideas to an equation for something like flocking, okay? So actually, I am going to need this. Is this up? Yeah, good, okay. Uh, escape. Okay, so the question is, how do you get from a model like the BSEC model or any other, whatever your favorite model for a flocking system is, in which you have discrete particles that are moving according to some rules. S and so, so you have a bunch of Ri's of T. And so you have a bunch of positions of particles as a function of time and the velocities of the particles as a function of time. And somehow you want to get from that to this continuum picture. So this is, this is the discrete picture. People sometimes call it the agent-based picture. Now, there's various names for this, but how do you get from that to a continuum description where you treat the space as having some row of R and T being filled by continuous fields, row of R and T and V of R and T? So Mike, in his, his lectures this morning, illustrated one way to do that, which is to start with the rules for this and actually do manipulations on the equations for these distributions and arrive at this. The problem with that approach, as, as Mike, I think, emphasized very well in his talk, is that unless you construct the model very carefully the way he did, these intermediate steps are almost impossible without making some uncontrolled approximations. And furthermore, there's always the fear that there's some important element in this original model that you started with, uh, some important element that's absent in this original model that you started with. So you don't necessarily get the generic description over here. So what I want to do is describe how you can get these from, without even knowing the details of this model, just knowing that there's some set of rules that give the positions and velocities as a function of time that lead to an ordered flocking state, that lead to a state where the average of V is non-zero. Just knowing that and knowing that the microscopic rules have certain symmetries, in particular rotation invariance, can I just from that, by pure unaided reason alone, figure out what the description should be over here? And the answer is, if you're willing to accept the fact that there are going to be a lot of phenomenological parameters that you're not going to know when you do that process, the answer is you can do this. Okay, and I want to describe that process today. Okay. So, so how do you do that? Okay. So the important thing is we're going to use the symmetries, and we're also going to use something I didn't really talk about yesterday, which are conservation laws. And I want to start off by telling you why those are the important things, okay? 
And I want to re-emphasize that I'm doing a gradient expansion, so I'm going to do be doing a theory that's valid only if length scales are much bigger than some microscopic length scale, and the time scales are much bigger than some microscopic time scale, or than any microscopic length scale and microscopic time scale. Okay, so uh, how do we do that? Well, to start, you have to ask, how do I even know that these are the right variables? Right? I, th I think we ha ha had, ha we've had some discussion of that in, in uh, Dean's lectures this morning as well. How do you know that these are the right variables? There are a million other variables, there are actually an infinite number of other variables you can imagine uh, possibly playing a role in this system. And uh, I like to call this the Gazorin platt effect. You know, frequently happens to me that when I'm giving talks about this subject, and I'll describe something like this, and I'll say this could be a model for the motion of bacteria, and there's a biologist in the audience, and he raises his hand and he says, yes, but what about Gazorin platt Where Gazorin platt is, of course, it's a word I made up. He's using some wo word that, as far as I can tell, he made up because I've never heard it before. And I have no idea what this concept is, but he obviously thinks it's very important. My deep fear, of course, is that he spent his whole life working on Gazorin platt And so if I tell him it doesn't matter, that's not going to go down very well. Right? Furthermore, you know, it's a good question. How do we know these are the important variables? How do we know there's not some other variable, I'll just call it x of O and T, that also plays a crucial role in the hydrodynamic descriptions? What narrows us down to these variables? Okay. If you want a really good discussion of how you get to this, you should look at a book. There's a book by Dieter Foster. It's quite an old book now. And it's got a very off-putting title. It's called Correlation Functions, Broken Symmetry. I, I can't even remember the whole title. It's so complicated. But if you look for Dieter Foster, it's published in the 1970s. He gives a really beautiful description in the first couple of chapters of how you decide what the hydrodynamic variables are and how you formulate hydrodynamic equations. And uh, the discussion I'm going to give of how you get rid of these x variables is stolen entirely from him. Okay? So how do you deal with the gazorin platt variable? Well, a lot of what I'm going to... I'm going to use an argument that I'm going to use a lot in these talks, which is what I like to call the Germanic principle of physics. Okay? So it comes from the comparison of the legal systems of three countries, the United States, Britain, and Germany. Okay? So in the United States, if something's not explicitly forbidden, it's allowed. Okay? So uh, for example, if you drive into a city and you find an empty par parking space by the side of the road, and there is not a sign there that says no parking, then you're perfectly free to park there. Okay, so that's the American system. Anything that's not forbidden is allowed. In Britain, it's a little different. In Britain, if you drive, especially out in the countryside, and you drive into a little village, you have to go to the parking place. There's a sign that says, you can, may park here. The par you know, it's often called the... Well, an anyway, there's, th there's always a place like that, so, so, you, so you can park there. If you park anywhere else, you'll get a ticket, even if there's not a sign there saying no parking. This causes immense problems in my family, because I'm from a multicultural family. My wife is English. And every time we go to an American city and I want to park the car on the street, uh, she'll say, but wait, there's not a sign there saying you can park here. And I try to explain to her that, no, this is America, and it's only if there's a sign saying no parking that we can't park there, but she won't buy it. So we frequently wind up visiting cities and driving around and going back home without ever getting out of the car. It's a bit of a problem. But in contrast to both these systems is the German system, in which anything that's not forbidden is compulsory. Okay. <laughs> so if you drive into a city, there's a place where you have to park, and you don't have a choice about it. Okay. The natural world is the, obeys the Germanic principle. If it's not forbidden, it's compulsory. And other speakers at this uh, series have used that idea. They haven't perhaps used those exact words for it. But if you cannot think of an argument that would forbid a certain term in some equation of motion, then the chances are that the natural world, by hook or by crook, is going to figure out a way to put that term there. OK? All right. So what has that got to do with the gazorin platt variable? Well. Suppose there is some gazorin platt variable. And to, to, to give you an example, some people might think, if you talk about the VSEC model, that a really crucial thing is how many birds have more than some critical number, say, five or six nearest neighbors. Okay? And you can imagine having a, a, a density for that. So you're going to write down some equation of motion for that x. Okay? And what is it going to have? Well, by the Germanic principle, it's going to have pretty much anything you can think of on that side, unless it's forbidden by symmetries, or conservation laws. Now, this x is not a conserved quantity. 
right? The, the number of birds that have five or six nearest neighbors can, can change. Uh, the total number of birds that have five or six nearest neighbors can change in the whole system. There's no conservation law for it. Therefore, there's nothing that forbids a term like this. Therefore, there must be a term like that. Okay? Now, what else can there be? Well, let's suppose for the moment we've decided that these are the other important variables in the problem. Okay? And the only other possible important variables in the problem. Well, then over here, you could also have some function of v and rel. Okay? So what good does this do you? Well, the good it does you is when you think about the fact that you're looking at long times. Okay, so if you're looking at long times, if time is very long, that means dt is very small. In particular, it's much less than any microscopic time. This is a microscopic time. Therefore, if I look at the system on time scales longer than this microscopic time, that is going to be negligible relative to that. Yes? I'm sorry, it, it is not, say it, run that by me again. Right, and I'm uh, sure, and I'm and I'm just saying I'm now looking at that system on time scales longer than that time scale. Um, never having thought about that, my safest course at this point is probably to say, uh, let me exclude that case and focus on systems that just have a static steady state. Okay. Um, I could, I could say something in response to that, but I've been making it up off the top of my head, which means the probability that it's going to be wrong is very high. Okay? So if we exclude that, then you've got this, and we've just decided that the time derivative term on the right-hand side is negligible. We can replace it by zero. Now, of course, there's a catch here. There's another catch, which is what I thought Erwin was saying originally. I was hoping it was, because that, this one I can answer. You don't know what that time scale is, right? And so in a given experiment, you don't necessarily know that the approximation that I've just made is valid. If it's not, then this Gazorian-Platt variable is important, and you better keep track of it. And there are examples like that. Um, I'm looking around for some non-Newtonian fluid here. Uh, okay, anyway, you've all seen silly putty, right? Silly putty is a liquid. Right. Has everybody seen silly putty? Does everybody know what I'm talking about? It's, it might be called something else in other countries. Okay, good. So silly putty is a liquid, and you can tell, because if you take a rolled-up sphere of silly putty and you put it on a table and you leave the room and you come back the next day, it'll spread out just like a drop of water. But on the other hand, you can take it and throw it into the table and it'll bounce off. The reason for that is that the microscopic time in silly putty is actually minutes or hours, because the silly putty is made out of complicated polymers that get entangled and it takes them a long time to disentangle. Everything I'm saying about hydrodynamics is only, apl only applies assuming that all those time scales are shorter than the time scales you're looking at. So there can be situations in which the particular experiment you want to explain, like bouncing the silly putty off the floor, is not going to be accurately described by hydrodynamic theory. Okay. There's no particular reason to think in something like a VSEC model that there are any long time scales like that hidden in here. So I'm going to assume that in most simulations, if you simulate for more than a few time steps and you have more than 10 or 20 birds, uh, this is going to be a reasonable approximation. You're guaranteed it's going to be a reasonable approximation at some time. You don't know what that time is. Okay? But if you can accept that limitation, then you can either call it a limitation or you can say, I'm only going to talk about times that are longer than any microscopic time. If I do that, I can set this side to zero, and now instead of a differential equation for x, I have an instantaneous relation between x and the velocity field. Okay? So x of r and t is going to be f of v of r and t and rho of r and t. So now when I come to write down my equations of motion for rho and v, they're closed. The gazorian platt -Platt variable may indeed be involved in, you know, there may be something in here, some functional of x of r and t, that appears in here, it may play a very important role, and other stuff involving rho and v. 
But I don't have to keep track of this as a separate variable. I can just take this solution here and stick it in here. And now this whole thing on the right-hand side can be written as some other functional. H is a loaded word, but it's just some other functional of rho and v. So in the end, all I have to think about is rho and v. Okay. Questions before I go on? Yeah. Perfect question. That's exactly where I was going next. Why can't I eliminate everything? Why do I need to keep V in row? Remember, the dramatic principle says if it's not forbidden, it's compulsory. But some things are forbidden by certain principles. Okay? So, what are those principles? Well, of course, they're the principles. Well, they're these bottom two points here. Okay. What sort of variable cannot have a term like this? Well, it's a variable which, one example is a va well, it's a variable whose global integral cannot decay with time, right? I any such variable obviously could not have a term like this because then its global, in its global integral would decay exponentially with time with that time constant, okay? So what value, so the variables we need to keep in a hydrodynamic description are the slow variables. So you keep only slow variables. And what I mean by slow variables is precisely variables which for one reason or another, are not allowed to have a term like that. That's forbidden. Well, when I say forbidden, I don't mean accidentally because you happen to choose an algorithm that left something zero. I mean forbidden by some deep fundamental principle that applies to the system that you're trying to describe. Okay? And what can those deep fundamental principles be? Symmetries and conservation laws. Okay? I'm going to talk about the simple one first, conservation laws. Rho is conserved. Okay? So that means that, that you are not allowed in this equation to have a term like minus rho over tau. If you did that, rho wouldn't be conserved. It, the, the total integral of rho would diminish over time. So that's forbidden. That means that rho is going to decay slowly because this is only going to involve um, that means rho is a slow variable. Okay, that's what I mean by a slow variable. Terms like that are forbidden. Okay, so conserved quantities are slow. Okay, that's why many of the lecturers at the summer school have been making such a fuss about saying I'm talking about dry active matter or I'm talking about wet active matter. In dry active matter, the only conserved quantity. is rho, the number density, the number of birds. In fact, interestingly, in if you think about biology, in many biological contexts, you don't even have this, right? Think about um, a colony of bacteria in which the bacteria are being born and dying on the same time scale that they're moving. You know, there are colonies like that. In a colony like that, you don't even have this conservation law. So even rho would not be a non hydrodynamic variable. In fact, you could have something you could have some steady state density that the system reached and some characteristic time constant with which it reached it. I like to call that a Malthusian flock. You know, Mal Malthus would have written down this equation if he'd been publishing in FizzRev letters rather than uh, you know, on vellum in St. Paul's churchyard. Right. So there are situations in which this is not true. But if we want to talk about situations in which the number of flockers is conserved, then rho is going to be a slow variable and you're not going to be allowed to have that term. Okay. So that's why we kept rho. Now, why do we keep V? Okay. Dry means the only conserved quantity is rho, so that means momentum is not conserved. So in the face of it, that makes it look like V is not going to be a slow variable. The trick is that conservation laws are not the only thing that makes slow variables. Symmetries can too. Okay. So let me illustrate the symmetry that will make V be a slow variable here. So suppose you have a flock. Let's take a really simple case. Everybody's moving in the same direction initially. Okay, so this is uh, some T1. Okay. And then there's a time step. You run, say, the V-sec algorithm. There's 
all these birds make errors. And let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that they all make exactly the same error. They all turn to the right by exactly the same amount. Okay? In other words, we're considering a spatially uniform fluctuation. Okay? So you'll notice the state I started in is a steady state. If this was an equilibrium system, I would call that the ground state. But it's a state which, in the absence of noise, would just persist forever in the VSEC algorithm, right? Is, is that clear to everybody? If you have any kind of algorithm where things are aligning, if everybody is aligned instantaneously and you have no noise, they're going to just move in that straight di direction for all time, okay? So now you've gone to this state. So my question to you is, how long is it going to take this state to relax back to that state if there's no further noise? Anybody? Infinite. Forever. It can't relax. The reason is rotation invariance. Rotation invariance says that whatever the microscopic rules are, they do not pick out any special direction a priori. If those microscopic rules can lead to a state like this as a steady state, they could therefore automatically could just as well have led to this state as a steady state. If that's the case, then this state cannot relax back to that state. Okay? So that tells you, if we think of these arrows as representing the velocity, We've now had a velocity fluctuation, and I think I talked about this geometry yesterday. That velocity fluctuation, if this angle is small, is principally perpendicular to the mean direction of motion. And you can see that that variable is not going to relax back to zero okay, at any finite rate, at, at any rate in this perfectly uniform case. Okay? So that tells me, so, so if I'm making a list of slow variables, I've now got two. One is rho, or actually I've got d slow variable. So I've got rho, which is so variable, slow variable, and y. It's slow because of conservation. And I've got v perp, which is slow because of rotation invariance. Another word people, there are a couple of phrases that people often use with this, which you'll probably have heard before. Uh, this is sometimes called the Goldstone mode. It just means it's a variable that can't relax because it's associated with a broken symmetry. It's sometimes called the broken symmetry variable, various other terms. But the argument is basically this. It's that any fluctuation which, if uniform, just takes you from one steady state to another steady state can't relax. Okay? Is that clear? This is wh what I've just told you is 99% of what you need to know to do hydrodynamics. Okay? Be because the Often, the biggest part of the battle is identifying the variables. Now, you'll notice, so, 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 so you understand my counting now, right? There are d minus 1, v is a d component vector. There are d minus 1 components perpendicular to the mean velocity. So there's d minus 1 variables here, and there's one variable there. So we have a total of d variables, d hydrodynamic variables. Now, if you were paying attention yesterday, you'll have noticed that I wrote down an equation not for v perp, but for v. And the reason I was doing that was just because I'm not as smart as I would like to be. I could, using symmetries and conservation laws, have written down a set of equations of motion for rho and v perp directly. But I found it easier to think about rotation invariance and so on in terms of not v perp, but the full v. Okay, so that's what I did. So I actually kept the full V rather than just looking at V perp. And in doing so, I kept a Gazorin Platt variable. I think that's, well, it's a made up word, so I can spell it any way I want. I kept a Gazorin Platt variable. That Gazorin Platt variable is what I'll call delta V parallel. Okay. So if I have a local velocity fluctuation, if I go from... This velocity, uh, so let this be the average velocity of the flock. At any point in space, the real velocity in a fluctuating system is going to be different. And I can take that difference, which I'm going to call delta v of r and t, that vector difference, and decompose it into its components along the uh, 
mean direction of motion, and that I call parallel for obvious reasons, and it's d minus one components perpendicular, which are v perp. Okay, those are hydrodynamic variables. That's not. Yes. Oh, it's the difference, uh, or it's the change. Uh, yes, but I'm defining uh, in, okay, this delta V is a fluctuation away from the steady state, okay? So it has, so yeah, I could have called this delta V perp, right? But that would imply that, you know, delta V perp, it would be, uh, v perp minus delta V. Okay, delta V is defined to be V minus the average of V, right? So that would say that delta V perp would be V perp minus the average of V perp, right? But by definition, the average of V perp is zero because V perp is in the direction that I call parallel. You know, V, the average of V is in the direction that I call parallel. So you're right, it is delta V perp, but it's also V perp. It's, it's just the way I define things. Okay? Um, all right. So, so this delta V parallel is a Gazorian plat variable, and it's easy to understand what that is. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Well, no, no, I'm sorry, no. It's the symmetry... It's a combination of the symmetry of the underlying dynamics, right? This argument depended on the rotation invariance of the underlying dynamics, but it also depended on the way that symmetry was broken in the state, right? I had to assume that this was actually a steady state of the system, and that's an assumption about the way the symmetry is broken. Oh, yeah, 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 good. N Good point, good, good, good point. There are limitations in the hydrodynamic theory. I've talked about a lot of them, but now I have to tell you the really crucial one. Imagine somebody comes to you and says, I've got this simulation, I've got these rules, I've got this noise, what's going to happen? The answer is you can't say. The reason is you don't know a priori if those rules with that noise can lead to this as a steady state or not. There's no way to know that. It, it's very analogous to the situation Suppose somebody comes to you, you know, you know Schrodinger's equation, you, you know how to calculate electronic orbitals and stuff like that. So somebody comes to you and says, I've got two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom, and they're bonded together into a water molecule, and they're at 10 degrees Celsius. Will this be described by the Navier-Stokes equation? Well, the answer is, without some experimental input, you don't know. Because without some experimental input, you don't know whether... H2O at 10 degrees Celsius is a liquid or a crystal. If it's a liquid, it's broken no symmetries. And that implies that the only conservation laws are rho, are the only conserved quantities are density and momentum. Okay? And that implies the Navier-Stokes equations. But if the melt melting point of water had been 20 degrees Celsius, or if the water was at minus 10 degrees Celsius, then the Navier-Stokes equations would not describe it because it would be a crystal. It would have broken a symmetry. In fact, it would have broken a lot of symmetries, translation and rotation invariance in particular, and it would have a completely different hydrodynamic description. And you know it has a completely different hydrodynamic description because this flows. If it was frozen, it wouldn't, right? The behavior is going to be completely different. There's no way to tell, given a set of rules, which state the system's going to be in, unless you do something harder, like what Mike did this morning, actually do a calculation and have it tell you the values of the parameters. If you don't do that, if you're just arguing by symmetries, all you can say is, if your rules give me the state, then I can tell you what the hydrodynamic equations are and I can tell you everything. Okay? So, I mean, you know, this is why people can predict the flow of fluids through pipes without knowing anything about the chemistry of the fluids. Right? We know that all fluids, when they flow through pipes, are going to have a Poisset profile. Right? And so on and so on. Uh, but you only know that if someone tells you that it's a fluid. Right? If it's full of sand, it's going to behave completely differently. Right? Okay, so that's the point. So what I'm doing here is telling you how to develop a theory which, given a knowledge that this is the state you have, will tell you how that state's going to behave. I'm not telling you at all how you figure out whether a given set of rules will give you that state. All right? Is that clear? Yes.
Okay, the reason the perpendicular component is slow is that if you create a state where the perpendicular component is spatially uniform, it never relaxes. Right. There's nothing that's going to pull this back to here. Yeah, but, but oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, well, I'm sorry. I, I don't change the average speed, but I change... Okay, uh, maybe I should make this a little clearer. So let this be the mean velocity at t equals zero. Okay, and now I can say, keeping that as a reference, I'm going to try to write down an equation of motion that describes the subsequent evolution of the velocity. Okay, and if I do that, then a perpendicular fluctuation is going to be a slow variable because you, you, there's nothing to take you back to this original state. Okay, so I'm not I'm not constantly updating the the velocity I define define as the mean velocity. I'm just taking the initial mean velocity. Okay, the complication. I okay, that's that's what's going on there. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to have to uh, refer you back to the answer I gave to Irwin. If, 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 if we're in some complicated, if we're in some oscillating state, then things are just more complicated. I, I'm actually working on a problem like that right now, but I, th there, is for ex there are variations in the VSEC model where you introduce chirality, and instead of going into a state where things are uniformly moving, you go into a state in which the whole flock moves like this. I can't draw it, but you get the, uh, you get the idea. Each creature moves in a circle, and the whole flock moves around like that. And uh, I'm in the process of groping towards an answer, but I'm not confident enough in anything I think to repeat it in public. Okay, so, so if you have an oscillate, th the short answer to your question is if you don't have a steady state, then things change in ways that I have not thought through at all. Okay. So the assumption here is that the system is kind of like an equilibrium system in that it settles down to a steady state, but it's not equilibrium. Okay, these are all good questions, so keep going. Don't, uh, don't feel shy just because a few people have asked questions. Yes. Well, the idea is that, you know, these equations are a long wavelength description of the dynamics of this. And then, you know, you could imagine driving them in various ways. You could imagine putting this stuff in a, she sh a shear cell and imposing boundary conditions and seeing how, how these equations respond to you. You just look for solutions with those particular boundary conditions. So once you have a description, a long wavelength description, you can use it for any situation you want. So this could, in principle, describe uh, you know, what happens if you drive the, drive the system with external forces. Yeah. No, uh, OK. The equation will hold whenever the system, in the absence of external stresses, in the absence of any external perturbation that forces it to do something else, allows it to go to a steady state. Okay, it sounds a bit contrived, but 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 but, but think of the analogous example. If you think about a crystal, um, you know that it has a steady state where it's got some particular crystal structure. You also know that if you're subjected to a shear stress, that crystal structure distorts. But nonetheless, you can describe the crystal with the elastic theory that you developed as, a, as an expansion around this state. So, so you can do the same thing here. Of course, if you drive it very hard and you drive it into a strongly nonlinear regime, then you meet, may need to keep nonlinearities beyond the ones that I'm going to keep. And, and I should probably emphasize that. My purpose in doing all of this is to get a hydrodynamic theory that I can use to describe the fluctuations just due to the noise I put in the equations of motion. And I'm going to assume that noise is fairly small. So things aren't driven very strongly nonlinear, although it turns out that in this problem, in any spatial dimension d less than 4, they're always driven somewhat nonlinear. But there are a countable number of nonlinearities that you actually need to keep. Okay. All right, so I think I'm going to press on here. Uh, so we've identified the two variables, and 
as I say, I'm going to choose to include this extra Gazorian plot variable, delta v parallel, just because it's easier to think about what rotation means in terms of the full v than it is to think about what it means, what rotation invariance means in terms of the full v, than to think about what it means in terms of v perp. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to explicitly eliminate it the way I showed you how you eliminated the Gazorian plot variable before. I'm going to get an equation of motion. The equation of motion I'm get is, get is going to involve an equation of motion for v delta v parallel, and I'm going to eliminate that and write it entirely in terms of delta v perp and rho. And so then I'll get a cl close set of equations for rho and v perp, and, and that's what I'll work with. Okay? But it, 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 it's just an easier route to get to that place. And presumably, if I was smarter, I could have gone directly to writing down the equations for this, but I wasn't able to do it. Okay? Mm, questions? All right. So we've made a start. We've identified the variables. Okay. So now we need to cook up some equations of motion for them. Okay, so let's talk about rho first. Well, rho is conserved, so it must obey an equation of motion dt rho is minus div dot j. And here's where there get to be some subtleties, which uh, I'm still not quite sure whether you can get around these subtleties uh, by defining your velocity suitably uh, or whether uh, there's just a small mistake in our original formulation of the Toner 2 equations. I have checked that it doesn't matter. Our idea, you highs and my idea, was that we would just take J to be rho times V. That is to say the mass current is just due to the convection of uh, density by the local fluid velocity. And that's probably slightly wrong for reasons that Mike talked about in his talk because this velocity is a sort of coarse-grained average velocity and you also have individual particles moving relative to that coarse grain velocity, and that can be represented by a, short, a sort of diffusion. So you could imagine adding to this something like that. I've gone back and, look, I've gone back and looked at the final equations you get for v perp and rho if you include a term like that, and it doesn't change anything. This winds up just being a finite shift in a constant that's just a phenomenological parameter anyway, so it doesn't matter. So for the purposes of this lecture, because I prepared these notes before I understood that subtlety, I'm going to drop that term. But in principle, it should be there. Okay. And once you do that, that's, that's it. That's a closed equation. Or, I mean, that's an equation. It's not closed because we need an equation of motion for the velocity. So most of the work goes into figuring out the equation of motion for the velocity. So let's talk about how you do that. Okay. So, what are we going to say for the velocity? Well, um, ah, this is an appropriate point for an aside. Okay. So suppose we consider, consider a dead flock, or equivalently, consider inactive matter. or equilibrium. Okay. Well, and let's, and let's further, well, you know that in equilibrium, there can't be, in the presence of friction, there can't be a steady state with a constant velocity. Right? So the, the mean velocity has to be zero. That means there's no broken symmetry. That means there's no reason that V or any component of V should be slow. So V is fast. Okay. Therefore, we can do this process, this Gazorin plot process, which, by the way, Mike, Mike used a more formal term for this this, uh, this morning, uh, the adiabatic elimination of the fast variables in terms of the slow variables. And I just want to show you how that works because I'll show you that this recovers something that you're quite familiar with. So there's now no reason that V cannot have a term like that. Well, let me write it the way I wrote it before. Kay. 
You're allowed to have a term like that. What else could you have? Well, physically, actually, m maybe this is a good point to start talki talking about this in terms of symmetries. Okay? Even in a dead system, you still have rotation invariance. Or, or let's assume we're talking about a dead system with rotation invariance. Okay? So what does rotation invariance mean in the context of the velocity? What it means is the velocity is a vector, and it has certain transformation properties under rotation. Its time derivative is also a vector, so it has the same transformation properties under rotation. So if we're going to set it equal to something, what we s whatever we set it equal to over here, this must be a vector. Okay? That's point one. Point two is that you don't get to choose the vector. That is, you can't specify some direction. I can't come in here and say, this should be north. Because the system is the dynamics is rotation invariant. It doesn't know north from south and east from west. Okay? So the only vectors I can put in here are vectors that the system picks itself. Okay? So what does it pick? You know, what vectors can I make just by looking at the density and velocity of the system? Well, I've already written down the most obvious one, the velocity itself. Right? So I'm allowed to have a term like that. Are there any other vectors I can make out of a scalar density field and a velocity vector? Yeah, grad rho, right. Okay, you know where this is going. Okay. So there can be I could have grad rho. More generally, I could have the gradient of any function of rho. Okay? So now let's apply the Gazoran Platt reasoning. Let's say we want to look and, and, and of course you recognize what this is. This is just y the freshman physics model for frictional drag, right? There's a drag force proportional to the velocity that goes opposite to it. Okay? I'm going to have the same term when I make the block living. The only thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the sign. And that's going to be a consequence of the fact the system can actually propel itself. Okay? But for now, this sign's going to be negative. Uh, we're going to look at time scales t much bigger than this relaxation time tau, which is set by the friction. On those time scales, I can drop this, and I'm going to get v is uh, minus tau rad p of rho. Okay? Are you with me? So now, obviously, to close this equation, I need to specify an equation of state. I need to specify what p of rho is. Let's assume that rho of r and t is some mean density plus some small fluctuation. Okay? If I do that, then I can tailor expand P of rho around rho naught. And unless I'm very unlucky and I chose rho naught to be some very special place in the function P of rho, uh, P of rho will have a good Taylor series around there. And so this will be some P of rho naught, which obviously is going to drop out of this expression when I take the gradient, plus some constant times delta rho. Okay? So if I stay, and then there'll be higher order terms, but those will be negligible if delta rho is small. So I'm going to drop those, stick this in here, and I see this is going to be minus T A grad delta rho, which is what somebody in the audience suggested, and that is indeed a good approximation when you're talking about small density fluctuations. And now I'm going to be very suggestive, and I'm going to take that, and I'm going to call it D. Right now it's just a name, right? And now I can go back to this equation. And again, play the same game. I've got a row in here, but I can say that's rho naught plus delta rho. You'll notice that V is already of order delta rho. So the delta rho piece of this, when it's combined with the V, gives it something order delta rho squared, and I'm going to drop that. So if I do that, what am I going to be left with? Sorry. Let me give a properly suggestive name. I'll call that D over rho zero, and for now that's just a name. Okay. What am I going to get over here? So I replaced rho with rho naught, because I dropped the delta rho bit, because that's higher order. And v is given by that. So v, to write this out neatly, v is minus d rad rho, d over rho naught, rad rho. So what's that going to give me if I stick it in there? This is fusion equation, right? I'm going to get the divergence of the gradient of rho. So I'm going to get the rho naught is going to cancel that rho naught that I conveniently put in there. The minus sign is going to cancel out minus sign. I'm going to get d del squared rho. Okay. Point I want to make is, you could have written down this equation off the bat by saying rho is the only slow variable, 
So therefore, it, it's a slow variable because it's conserved, so it's, ti it's time derivative must be the divergence of a current. And that current, if I keep rho as the only variable, then the only, then j has to be a vector by rotation invariance, and it has to be a vector that I can make out of the only thing I have available, which is this scalar field rho. The only vector I can make, to leading order in del rho anyway, is something proportional to del rho. And that would have immediately have led me to this equation. So the point is, this, th there's two ways to get to the hydrodynamic equations. One way is to say I'm brutally only going to consider from the outset the slow variables and apply the symmetry arguments as hard as I can, and that'll get you to the right place. Or if you like, you can include extra variables, eliminate them in this way, do this adiabatic elimination, and in the end, you get back to the same place. Okay. And which way you choose to do it just depends on which way makes more sense to you, which way is more intuitive, which way is it easier to see the consequences of the symmetries, and so on and so on. Okay. And so that's, what that, 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 that's the approach I'm going to take. I'm going to choose variables that will include the slow variables and, in my case, one extra fast variable just because it makes it easier for me to think about it, and then eliminate the fast variables and get an equation for the slow variables. Okay? Is that clear? Okay. So, now let's start thinking. Uh, let's see. Yeah, go ahead. Higher order in V, did you say? Um, oh, okay. So, so for example, aha. Uh -huh. You could sort of nicely segue into the next point. You could imagine that the damping coefficient here is nonlinear, so you have something like minus beta V squared V. Right. You certainly could, okay? But if you assume that your field fluctuations are small, and this is where assuming the fluctuations are small helps you, okay? If you assume these fluctuations are small and you neglect... So the way you can reason your way out of this is you can say, let me assume that this term turns out to be small. I'll do the calculation assuming that, and then I'll come back and check a posteriori whether that worked, okay? So I drop this term, I do this calculation, I get V going like the gradient of delta rho. I assume that delta rho was small, so V is small. If V is small, then this is negligible compared to that. So that's the kind of reasoning you have to do all the time. That reasoning gets really tricky when you're talking about a flock. Because in a flock, remember, um, what I'm going to do, basically, is I'm going to make this term positive. And now the speed that you actually get is going to be a balance of these two terms, and there's no guarantee that it's going to be small. So, so you have to instead expand around some finite velocity, and that creates an enormous number of headaches, but it can be done properly. That's the idea. Okay? All right, so good, good question. And of course, even in this case, if you had some external force in here that was really huge, so that it created a big velocity, then I would need to worry about terms like this. The hydrodynamic description is not going to work if you force the system too hard. And, and we know that. You, know, you can create things like shocks. You can create things where the important length scales are actually quite short. And then all my assumptions go out the window. But what I'm assuming here, since what I want to look at is what's the effect of the noise? Does it disorder the system? And I'll be happy if I can show th that, that sufficiently weak noise does not disorder the system. So I can consider small noise, and then hopefully I can get away with this. But I'm going to have to check in the end, a posteriori, whether the things I neglected really are small or not. And there's a bit of suspense in doing this sort of thing because you don't know when you start what things you're going to be able to get away with neglecting and what things you want. Right? And sometimes you have to go back and start over and think about what those extra things are. But, that, but that's going to be the idea. Okay. So. Okay. So let's see. Yeah. So now basically what I'm going to do for the rest of the lecture is talk about a live flock, so active matter, non-equilibrium, and think about what happens. Okay. And, and I'm going to assume, or I'm going to try to construct my hydrodynamic equations such that they have a steady state solution where the average V of R and T is non-zero. Okay, so same game as I just played here. I'm going to say DTV 
is going to be stuff. It's going to be some vector. And I'm only allowed to make that vector out of variables that the system gives me. So this vector has to be made out of the density and the velocity. I'm not allowed to use anything else. I'm not allowed to use some vector that I picked before I start the whole rule because I'm trying to model something that's rotation invariant. Okay, so what can we have? Well, I've already talked about one of the things you can have. V itself, perfectly good vector, okay? It's got some coefficient. In general, that coefficient does not have to be negative. And in fact, if I want to get a state like this, it better be positive, at least for some range of V. So what you high and I originally did was we assumed a form much like what I just wrote down, this, okay? If a constant times V is a vector, a constant times the magnitude squared of V times V is also a vector. So that's allowed. Now, of course, there's no reason to stop here. I could add some other constant times V to the fourth times V and so on. So the most general thing I could write down here would be some U of the magnitude of V times V. That's the most general thing of that class. That is a vector that I make using only the velocity. Kay. Is that clear? All right. Now, I need to think about what sort of state I want to look at. I want to look at a state like that. So that's going to impose some constraints on this function. Okay. S point I should make here is that when you start doing hydrodynamics, at first you think you're going to have an infinite number of parameters. Right? And right here, I've already got apparently an infinite number of parameters because I've got a whole function I can specify. And I I'm not doing a microscopic theory, so I, I, I don't, ha don't have some calculation that'll give me what this function is. So it looks like I've got infinite freedom in my model. Okay. So I'm going to start constraining that by using the fact that I want this model to give me a state like this. Because some experimentalist has come to me or some simulator has come to me and said, I've got this system and it shows a state that has this property. And I know it's underlying dynamics or rotation invariant. Okay, so what does that tell me about this U? Well, as we just said, it tells me that that U had better be positive, at least at small velocities. <laughs> so, you know, and you know, this is an example. So if I write this this way, that's an example of a U that does that. Okay, and if you look at that U, it looks like this. So here's U of the magnitude of V versus V. Now what I would say is that any U that looks like that is going to be good enough for my purposes. Right? If I have a U that looks like that, and I have my flock start at some low velocity, say it's hardly moving at all, say it's got some initial velocity that's down here very, very small. Because U is positive, that velocity is initially going to grow exponentially at a rate that's set by this intercept. So the velocity is going to grow up like this. Eventually, it's going to hit the point where u equals zero, and in the absence of any other effects, it's just going to stop. So that place is going to be v0, by which I mean, in the absence of fluctuations, that's going to be the mean speed of the flock. Okay? So that's a parameter of my model. Instead of this whole function, if I go to a state that is close to this state, I'm always going to be looking at speeds that are close to that point. So I can expand around that point. Okay. So what I'm going to say is that u of v, I'm going to tailor expand around that point. So it's going to be u of v naught plus u prime of v naught delta v parallel, right? Because uh, delta v parallel is the change in the magnitude of the speed. Okay. And um, okay, so that's what I'm going to have. What's u of v zero? It's zero, right? So that's gone. So the leading order term is u prime of v naught delta rho. Uh, I'm sorry, delta v parallel. And that is what's going to make delta v parallel a Gazorian plot variable. It's going to make it fast. Right? Can everybody see that? Because if I take this equation now, um, right? So project its component along v parallel, I'm going to get dt v parallel is going, or delta v parallel, because 
the main component of V parallel as a constant, is going to be uh, U prime of V0 delta V parallel times the at times V parallel, right? So I just took all I did was I took this equation and I projected it along the mean direction of flock motion, right? So I'm calling that the parallel direction. So can everybody see how I got from this to this? Okay. The the mean component of V parallel doesn't change, only delta V parallel changes, right? Only the fluctuation changes. And its rate of change is given by this, which is approximated by that, times the component of this along uh, the parallel direction, which is just V naught. Okay? So you see that I get a simple linear equation for delta V parallel in the absence of anything else. And what's the sign of that? Is that positive or negative? Anybody? It's negative. You can tell by looking at the picture, right? You're going from positive to negative. So u prime is negative, v naught is positive because it's just the magnitude of the speed. So this is less than zero. So I could define this to be, if I liked, to be one over tau parallel, the relaxation time of t parallel. And then anything else I put in here, any other function of rho and v perp, will be what delta v parallel will access to. Right? So I can eliminate this the way I eliminated the Gazor and Platt variable before. Okay? So that's how I'm eventually going to be able to get rid of this v parallel. Okay? So the only parameter, there's only two parameters I actually wind up needing, which are v0 and this u prime. Okay? So, so, this, so I've gone from having an entire unknown function to having two unknown numbers, okay? which I just will fit to experiment. And you can think of this relaxation time as, you know, imagine I, I started trying to run up the slope up there, and I started out running as fast as I possibly could sprint. You know that that's not the steady state speed. I'm going to go right up this hill, right? <laughs> I'm going to slow down, right? And this is the characteristic time for slowing down, right? So, so if you're going to, I didn't finish the story here, but obviously if you start with a flock that's moving too fast, U is going to be negative, and it's going to slow down, and it's going to settle down to this equilibrium speed. And this tar parallel is just the time it takes for that to settle down, and it's one of the parameters of the model. Okay? Any questions about this? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm 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 trying to look at the simplest case. Uh, I've worried about that a bit. Uh, I guess if you had something like that, you could imagine you might have some kind of bi-stability where it settles down either to this state or to that state, and uh, I haven't thought about that case. Okay, so I'm, I'm taking the simplest, so it's not, it's, it's generic, but it's not general, if you know what I mean. You know, there, there are, in, in the space of possible functions, there, there, there's a finite subset of those that, that will look like this, that will only be positive at small velocities and only negative at big velocities. In fact, you would think, it, intuitively, I think most creatures would work like that. You know, that there'd be uh, some, mat some speed I was comfortable going at, and if I was going slower, I would speed up. If I was going faster, I'd slow down, and I wouldn't have the option of going 10 times as fast. But, yeah, you know, you can certainly imagine counterexamples, and you could very easily program a counterexample, right? But, and something interesting may happen there. I just haven't, ha haven't thought about it, okay? So, so I'm going to focus on situations where either you don't have that, or it's so far away in phase space that you, you never have a fluctuation that carries you over there, okay? Yeah, so there, there, you know, there are some more assumptions here, but they're all assumptions about you know, what sort of state you have, what, what, what sort of system you have. Uh, all the things you don't know are buried in these phenomenological parameters. You know? And if you were really good and you could calculate these from kinetic theory or some other approach, you know, then you'd know those parameters. But for me, I'm perfectly happy to take a few parameters from experiment. Okay? All right, so that's what we can make just using the velocity. Not, velocity is not the only hydrodynamic variable we have. We have the density. What can we make using the density? Anybody? I'm going to make you guys think of all these terms. So what vector can I make out of the density? Sorry? 
Yeah, okay, it's just the thing we had before, right? You could have the gradient of the density, uh, the gradient of the density, or more generally, you could have the gradient of any old function of the density that you wanted. Okay? And that, if you look at that, those of you who have seen the Navier-Stokes equation will recognize that. It's just the pressure term in the Navier-Stokes equation. Right? Now, however, there's a new wrinkle. This is not a Galilean invariant system. Therefore, the pressure could potentially depend not only on the local density, but on the local speed. Germanic principle of physics. There's no reason it can't, therefore it will. Okay? Notice I only put in the magnitude of the speed because this has to be a scalar. And uh, by, but well, by rotation invariance, it can't depend on the direction of V, but it can depend on the magnitude. Yes? We should have. Thanks. So now um, I'm going to have to think not only about how rho varies with the speed, but how rho varies with you, and that's another parameter. Okay. So, so, the pram so maybe I should start making a list of the parameters. One of the disappointing things about this theory is that there are a lot more parameters in this equation than there are in the Navier-Stokes equation. There's nothing I can do about it. That's the nature of the problem. Okay. But the good thing is you can figure out what they all are. Okay, so parameters. Got V0. We've got u prime of v0, or equivalently tau parallel. We've got partial u, partial rho, evaluated at v0 and rho0, where rho0 is the mean density, and v0, as we've already discussed, is the mean speed. Okay, so three parameters so far. It's going to get worse, I'm sorry to say. Okay. You can likewise do a Taylor expansion of p in powers of rho minus rho naught and, and speed minus v naught. Yes? Yes. Yes. If you have a Galilean invariant system, you can't have V in there. Oh. Um, no, you could have rho in there. Okay. The, the, the argument in the passive case was that we're expanding for small fluctuations in rho. And the U term was already multiplying something that was linear in rho. So if we'd added a dependence on delta rho, it would have been at least quadratic in delta rho, and we're assuming that those terms are small. You might think it would, but the active system, see, the tricky thing with this active system is it's going to turn out that the fluctuations are quite big. And it's going to turn out that they're big enough that I'm actually not going to be able, as I was in the diffusive case, basically I got a linear equation. And you can actually systematically go back and include all the nonlinear terms that I was talking about and show that if you drive this equation with a small noise, that those nonlinear terms are unimportant. Okay, at least if the noise is small enough, which is the only case I'm going to focus on. Here it turns out that even if you drive the thing with a very small noise, as long as the noise is non-zero, some of the nonlinearities are still going to matter. Right? In, in particular, uh, there's a convective nonlinearity, which I haven't written down yet, which turns out to stabilize the whole order in the first place in d equals 2. Okay? So anticipating that, I'm at the moment keeping some terms that are going to wind up being nonlinear. And a lot of them, a distressingly large number of them wind up mattering. Okay. So, all right. Okay, so we got that term. So this is something you can make out of rho that transforms like a vector. This is something you made out of v that transforms like a vector. Um, this one also involves the speed, but doesn't involve the, the sort of vector character of v in any way. Is there anything I can make out of both v and rho? Can I somehow combine those two in some interesting way? I mean, this obviously depends on v and rho, but I would call this a rather boring dependence because it's only a dependence on the speed. Is there anything where I actually use the vector nature of v and combine it with rho in some way to make something that's a vector? Kay. I mean, in a sense, I've already done that here because this term has the dependence on rho. But is there anything else I could do? Sorry? Tensor product of v and grad rho. So uh, what do you mean by that? Okay, actually, let's... Let me, see, let me see if I can make the rest. I, I think you know the answer. Let me see if I can make the rest of the audience reconstruct the answer. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take some v with some index, some v, let's write this equation in Einstein notation, okay, which just means I, I label the, c the components. Okay, so I'll call that vi. Okay, so I labels the Cartesian components. 
Uh, so I want to make some combination of a V with some index, a V with another index, and sorry, what was the third thing? Right. So a D with some other index, rho. And the name of the game, you know, an another way to say I want to make vectors on this side is to say that when I'm done with all these indices and I'm done applying the Einstein summation convention, I only have one free index left. Okay? So what labels can I put in? So that means I've got, I've got three indices here. Two of them have to contract because I'm only allowed to have one left. Okay? So what can I put in here that will make this have a single free index i and everything else be eaten up by the Einstein summation convention? Somebody else. You, you obviously know the answer, so I'm going to ask somebody else to give me this term. Yeah, ijj will work. Okay, so vi, vj, dj. If you wanted to write that in vector notation, you would write that as v, v dot grad rho. Okay? Now, in the Navier-Stokes equation, you don't have a term like that. The reason you don't have a term like that is Galilean invariance. If you boost to another reference frame, this term will change. So it's forbidden in a Galilean invariant system. Unfortunately for us, we're not in a Galilean invariant system, so this is here. Okay? And it actually makes physical sense. Okay? The usual pressure force says that if I create a pressure gradient, if I have high density over there and low density over there, there's a force. You know, this is an acceleration, so it's basically like a force that's going to make me accelerate in that direction. Okay? It also says, this term, that if I instead, so say that direction is the mean direction of flock motion. Okay, so this term says, if I have a gradient of the density in the mean direction of flock motion, I accelerate in that direction. Makes sense. Suppose I have a, a density gradient of the same magnitude, but perpendicular to the direction of flock motion. Okay, well, it's going to respond to that too, and this term will reflect that. But what tells you that once you've broken the symmetry by picking a special direction for the flock to move in, that it's going to respond to a pressure gradient in that direction in exactly the same way that it responds to a pressure gradient perpendicular to that? The answer is nothing. So by the Galilean, um, Galilean, by the Germanic principle of physics, there's nothing that says that the response to a there has to be a term that makes the response to a pressure gradient that way different from the response to the pressure gradient that way. Okay. So in other words, something that says that if you're along v, it's different than if you're perpendicular to v, and this does that. Right? It says along the direction of flock motion there's an extra pressure-like force that depends on the gradient in that direction. Okay, the projection of the gradient onto that direction. Nothing forbids that, so it must be there. Okay, is that clear? This is a term, by the way, if you go back to you highs and my original paper in 1995, we missed this term, but it's certainly allowed in this context. In fact, something a little bit worse is allowed. Just like here, we didn't have to make the pressure linear in rho. We could make it an arbitrary function, which we then later expanded. Here, we can have another function of rho. I call it P2 because it doesn't have to be the same as P. It can be something else. So when I eventually develop the full hydrodynamic theory, I'm going to expand this function about the mean density and the mean speed. And that's going to introduce some other coefficients. So I'm going to have... So what do we got? We've got uh, um, expansion coefficients for P and P2. It turns out you only have to go to second order, so there's two of these and two of these. So we're up to seven parameters. Sorry about that, but that's the way it is. Okay? So that's what this term is. And just to make it look more like that term, I'm going to make the overall sign negative. That's just a definition of the way function uh, property of the way I define P2. Got that. P2 of rho and v. Okay. What else can we have? We haven't yet gotten some of the terms uh, that you have in the Navier Stokes equations. Okay? In fact, I, I should make a confession. I'm making it sound like you, Hi, and I sat down in our offices and thought deep thoughts and applied the fundamental principles and came up with these equations. That's not the way we actually did it on the first pass. It never is on the first pass. The way we did it on the first pass is what I, I like to call the, uh, the uh, pretty woman meets out of Africa approach. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie the, the Player. It's about a Hollywood producer. And half of the movie consists of him listening to people come in, pitching to him their ideas for movies. And one of them comes in and is pitching some idea, and he, and he, and he says something to her, and she says, that's right, it's pretty woman meets out of Africa. 
And that, of course, you know, is the way most movies are put together. You know, King Kong meets Godzilla. You know, you have two movies that are successful, and, and you say, well, let's cram them both together. You know, you know, Superman meets Batman, that sort of thing, right? So, uh, you Hai and I took the same approach. We said, you know, we're trying to describe this flocking problem. We realized pretty quickly that we wanted to use the same variables as used in the Navier-Stokes equations, rho and v. And so, we knew the continuity equation for rho, so that was pretty simple. So then we thought, so what can we write down for v? And we said, well, wha what do we know? Well, we know the Navier-Stokes equation, right? Okay? So we started with that. So, so, so I, I sort of wrote that down as line one, right? And then what else did we know? Well, you know, what else do we know about? Remember when I was talking about this problem yesterday, I said that uh, it's also a bit like a ferromagnet, right? It's a, or, or the pointer problem, if you like. Okay? Well, people have written down the hydrodynamic equations for the pointer problem. I won't show you how you derive them, but you can derive them by this sort of reasoning. And what they look like are dt... So I'm going to pretend the vector... I'm going to call the vector that, that characterizes the direction the pointer's point in v. Okay? But it, for the pointers, obviously, it's not a speed. It's just a... A, a direction. But the equation people write down for that is okay. So there was line one. Okay. So that's a simple fluid. There's line two. That's the magnet. So we stared at those for a few minutes and said, "What does that tell us about what the equations for the flock might be?" And we finally said, "Let's just cram them together." Let's just take everything that's in here and put it up here, and everything in, you know, and keep, keep everything that's already up here, up here. You'll notice, encouragingly, that there's at least one term that appears in both equations, right? Here, this represents spin diffusion. Here, it represents viscosity, but it's, it's the same term, exactly the same form. And that was it, and that was our first pass. That, that, that was Mach 1 of the Tony 2 equation, and it's uh, actually not very different from the final version. But, of course, one of the things we missed in doing this was this term, okay? And there, there were a few other things, but, uh, but that's how we really did it. And then we went back and said, okay, let's be systematic. Let's apply all this hydrodynamic reasoning and figure out what else we missed. And we actually got some hints from some people who pointed out to us things that we'd missed and so on, and eventually settled down on the final version. Okay, so anyhow, the Navier-Stokes equation tells me another term I can make that looks like a, a vector, and what's that? Well, it's, it's this guy right here. And this has a really simple physical interpretation. If you think about fluids, it's like a viscosity. And what it does is it makes the velocity spatially uniform. And so this is the term that reflects the physics of whatever mechanism is making these creatures all move in the same direction. You know, it could be something like the Wieseck algorithm, where they just explicitly look at the direction their neighbors are moving and try to move in that direction. You can have other mechanisms, like if you have self-propelled spheres like the type Mike was talking about this morning, but you allow them to have a, a contact interaction that's inelastic. So imagine these two guys go along, they bump into each other, and there's some sort of inelastic collision, so they wind up coming out, moving at a smaller angle than they were coming in at. This will align them as well. Okay? So whatever the microscopic physics is, it's captured by that. Okay? And sometimes we call this eta, sometimes we call it d. Okay? In fact, I think here I'll, I'll, I'll call it D1. Okay? Any questions about that one? Okay, it's just, if you have a vector, you can take derivatives of it and make it a vector too. We're constrained that we've got to take derivatives that, uh, uh, whose, in, um, whose indices are contracted, and, and, and so that's what we've done. Okay? Questions about that? Is there any other vector you can make? So, okay, so now, now we're looking at terms that are made out of two gradients and one velocity. Is there anything else you can make with two gradients and one velocity that transforms like a vector? Sorry? Grad row, grad v. Um, um, okay. The, the, let me qualify this. Two dense, two gradients. No, I, I just want to use two gradients and one velocity. I, I, I'll consider. You know, I, I, I've already talked about terms coupling. In fact, wait, wait, two grads and one v. 
Let me talk about those terms later. I probably won't wind up talking about them at all. They, they wind up being unimportant. But uh, let's just, for now, talk about two gradients and one velocity. Right. You can have the gradient of the divergence of V. And in fact, this term is also in the Navier-Stokes equations. In the Navier-Stokes equations, you call this the shear viscosity and that the bulk viscosity. Okay. So this will damp out fluctuations in which the velocity tends to compress the material. This will damp out those fluctuations. It will also damp out pure shear. Okay. So those ought to be there, so those are there. Yes. What, what I mean is they don't matter at long wavelengths. Okay. For any phenomena at long wavelengths, as long as you're only looking at small fluctuations driven by noise. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I admit, I admit, it's somewhat restrictive. But, uh, th you know, the fundamental question I'm trying to answer is, does this state exist? If it does exist, what sort of fluctuations does it have? Right. And as a starting point. The, the obviously, you know, any problem, you, you know, go through the t 150 years of the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. Any problem is done in there could be done here. And I sincerely hope that people will still be working on this equation 150 years from now. It's not going to be me. Not going to be any of you either. But uh, it's, uh, you know, the, 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 the there's a lot more going on than what, I've wh what I'm talking about here. But there's a lot going on what I'm talking about here too. Okay. So that's all we can do if we use one velocity. Suppose I remove the restriction on one velocity. Suppose I now allow myself to use any number of velocities. What else can I make? I still want two gradients, because remember, I'm doing a gradient expansion, so I don't want to put too many gradients in here. So I want two gradients and one velocity. And, and the net result has to be a vector. So again, so I want something where I've got a V, a gradient. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. I want two gradients and some number of velocities. And I don't care how many there are. So I could have V. No, that won't work, right? So if I try to do V I, well, V D V squared, and I want to put indices on these, Remember, uh, in the end, I have to have one free index. That won't work either. Because, oh, I'm sorry, oh, sorry, you, you want V. Ah, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, what am I looking for actually here? Hang on a second. Um, Uh, all right. Um, okay. All right, all, right, all right. Let's talk about those terms. You're right. Okay. So I could have something like this. V gradient of V, uh, divergence of V squared. Okay. Could have something like that. This isn't going to matter. And, and, and maybe at this point I should sh start showing you how you can reject some terms that look like it could potentially be important. I know this isn't going to matter. How do I know that this isn't going to matter? Because over here, I've already got a term that's proportional to V, and it doesn't have any gradients on it. So if I compare terms of the same type, here's something that's proportional to V with no gradients, here's something proportional to V with gradients, that's going to be negligible relative to that. So I can chuck that out. Notice I, I, I can't do that with this term because this term only has a comp only winds up when I expand around the mean the state of mean motion, this term only winds up getting a component along the direction of mean motion. Whereas this one gets a component perpendicular to the direction of mean motion. So I can't throw this one out relative to this one. But this one is only along the direction of mean motion. Uh, So I can throw that out. Okay. All right. What else can I make? Uh, 
convergence of so div dot okay so d d v and now we have to pair off the indices in some way okay so one way we could do it is d i d j d j v i that's this guy right or we could do d i'm sorry that's this guy or we could do d i d j v j that's that guy okay so this is actually all you can do if you use two gradients and one velocity. But now if I want to use more velocities, well, you can keep playing around. One of the things you'll realize you can make is this. Now, why do I keep this and not keep that earlier term we had? Because this will have components in the direction perpendicular to the mean velocity. Aha. So, so now, we're n now you're changing the rules because you're looking at one gradient rather than two, but you're absolutely right. I could have a term. I'm going to write it this way. V dot gradient V. Kay. That's there. Okay, and that's one, that's one of the terms. Kay. And in fact, if you think about that term, that is also in the Navier-Stokes equations right here. Okay, It's the convective term. The only difference is that here I have a parameter lambda 1, Whereas here, there's no parameter. The coefficient has to be 1. That's because the Navier-Stokes equations describes sorry, Galilean invariance. This is the Navier-Stokes. Describes a Galilean invariant situation. I don't have a Galilean invariant situation, so there's nothing that says that has to be 1, but there's nothing that says it has to be 0 either. Hideous complication is that, of course, this lambda 1 could be a function of rho and the speed. Okay? All right. So what else can I make of this form? What else can I make with one gradient and two velocities? Okay, so this is one way I can do it. So you notice, again, this is a particular way of contracting indices. If I wrote this as V with some index, D with some index, and V with some index, the rule is I have to pair off two of these by the Einstein summation convention and leave a free index that's I. So here what I chose is to make that index I and these in indices J, and you can see if I translate that back from Einstein summation language to vector language, I get that. But is that the only way I could have done this? Yep, that's right. So there's another term, lambda 3, which can also depend on rho and the magnitude of the speed, times the gradient of mod V squared. If you look online in my notes, all, 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 all these terms were in the, the equation we wrote down. Anything else? So two Vs, one gradient. So an another way to say it is lay down some sequence of indices here so that two of them repeat and one of them is I. Okay, so we've already had these two the same and that one be I. We made this one by taking these two the same, the two velocities the same, and that one i, what else could we do? We're only allowed to use one gradient. Right. So last term is lambda 2, again, of rho magnitude of v times v div dot v. So you have to be very careful when you write this to put in parentheses because if you write this too sloppily, this can look like... like like it's exactly that term, but it's not. The indices are contracted differently, right? Divergence of V times V, this is V dotted into the gradient acting on V, okay? So that's basically it. And, of course, the difficulty is that all of these coefficients, for that matter, these guys, could depend on the speed and the local density. Uh, and this guy, too. D3... The point I want to make here, and since it's almost the end of the summer school, there's something I want to emphasize to you, is that you could have done this. Anybody could have done this. It's just a matter of sitting down and thinking of all possible combinations of gradients and fields that involve small numbers of gradients and small numbers of fields and uh, make vectors. Yes? Mm, mm, mm. That can be a difficult question. 
Um, so the answer to that, which unfortunately I'm not going to have time to get into, is um, there's a kind of power counting you can do. Uh, it's it, it's a, a step in what's called the dynamical renormalization group, which is a technique for dealing with fluctuation effects in an equation like this. Okay, And um, you can, by arguments that simp boil down to counting on your fingers, figure out what terms are important and what are not. And um, so, so let, me, let, let me just illustrate one thing here. Um, naively, if you look at this term and this term, you say this is negligible compared to this because this only has one gradient and this has two. But this also has two velocities. Okay. You don't know how to count velocities versus gradients, so, so for, uh, initially you at least keep these both. And then when you do this power counting argument, which uh, I'd be happy to show people in private, you figure out that in high enough spatial dimensions, this one doesn't matter, but in lower spatial dimensions, it does. And, and, and there's a prescription for doing that, which uh, unfortunately would require at least one more lecture and probably an entire course to really get through. But um, there, there are well-defined ways to do that, and that, that's how you decide where to stop. Now, the harder question is, how do you know you've gotten everything? And uh, the answer is, you just rack your brains, and when, when a week has gone by and you haven't thought of anything new, you stop. And uh, that's what you do. The heartening thing is, nobody doing microscopic theories, where they've started with some microscopic model and done kinetic theory and tried to derive this from the bottom up, has gotten any term that we didn't, init that we didn't write down in the later version of the paper where we thought of these things. Okay, so re real human beings in a real finite amount of time can come up with all, all the possible terms that matter, all the possible terms that are relevant. Uh, that's not an answer to your question. I'm telling you that there is an answer to your question, but it takes a long time to explain it, and I've got one minute. So, but be ha I'd be happy to point you in the... The best place to learn it from is... Pa okay. There's a paper by Forster, Nelson, and Stephen. I believe it's Physical Review A, 1977. Um... Ironically, 1977 was the year that I started graduate school, and the middle author here, David Nelson, was my thesis advisor. We never discussed that paper. <laughs> Strange but true. Um, it has since been, been the basis for almost all the work I've done on any dynamical problem, and it's a tremendously good pedagogical paper. By the way, this is the same Forster as the one who wrote the book about hydrodynamics that explains how you do hydrodynamics, so he's had a real influence. This is a phenomenal pedagogical paper. And uh, it shows you in detail how to do something called the dynamical renormalization group, which is basically a trick for dealing with the nonlinearities in a stochastic differential equation like this. And uh, they, they just explain it far better than I could and certainly far better than I can in 30 seconds. And that, that, that's a good place to, to, to look and start learning about this. And everything we did on this problem was based on what those guys do in there. And you, you can literally sit down in the privacy of your own room and learn how to do this from that paper. Okay, uh, there's only one thing that we've left out here, which is what stirs the whole system, which is the noise. And that you just have to put in by hand. Okay, so we put that in. And now we have our stochastic nonlinear partial differential equation, and by doing this analysis, you can figure out what matters, okay? Um, S I think I'm supposed to stop now, is that right? Okay, so there's a lot I could tell you about what's wha what, what you can figure out from these equations. You can basically figure out everything that goes on in the flock, and um, you know, most of the hard work is done in actually constructing the equation, and then you just sort of turn the crank that these guys showed you how to turn. And then, if you're lucky, with hindsight, you can actually come up with a physical explanation like the one I gave yesterday of what actually physically is going on. Okay, so uh, thanks for your patience. Thanks for your tolerance of my bad blackboard technique and my bad jokes. And uh, that's all I have to say. Absolutely. Yeah.